I'm Paul Reyes, McDowell board member and editor of Virginia Quarterly Review. Welcome to Art and Urgency, Journalism in the Post-Truth Era, part of a series of panels and conversations that focus on the artistic disciplines supported by McDowell through fellowships at its artist residency in Peterborough, New Hampshire. This panel grows out of the Art of Journalism Initiative, which began in 2015 and through which McDowell has expanded the number of fellowships for writers engaged in deep reporting and long-form journalism. After an initial $1 million challenge grant from the Calderwood Foundation, McDowell has been able to raise nearly $2 million for 10 endowed fellowships for long-form journalists. You can learn more about McDowell's history, its mission, and the journalism initiative by visiting its website, mcdowell.org. The URL will be listed in the closing credits of this program. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Alex Marzano Lesnovich is the author of the lavishly praised The Fact of a Body, a Murder and a Memoir, which received the Lambda Literary Award, among many others, and was named one of the best books of the year by The Guardian. The recipient of a Rona Jaffe Award, Marzano Lesnovich has written for the New York Times Magazine, the Oxford American, Harper's, and is now an assistant professor at Bowdoin College. Alexis Okewo is a staff writer at The New Yorker, who won the Penn Open Book Award for their first book, A Moonless Starless Sky, Ordinary Women and Men Fighting Extremism in Africa. Okewa's work has been included in both the Best American Travel Writing and Best American Sports Writing anthologies. And they're currently at work on an alternate history of Alabama that combines memoir, criticism, and reportage. Jeff Charlotte is the best-selling author and editor of seven books of literary journalism, including The Family, recently adapted into a Netflix documentary series by the same name. His most recent book, This Brilliant Darkness, is a work of groundbreaking short-form journalism that was described in the Los Angeles Review of Books as, quote, transformative and essential, a prayer for and summoning of the human powers of observation, empathy, and compassion. He's an editor-at-large for VQR and is a professor and director of creative writing at Dartmouth College. Mira Subramanian is an award-winning journalist and author of A River Runs Again, India's Natural World in Crisis, a 2016 Orion Book Award finalist. Through her work, she has explored the disappearance, disappearance of India's vultures, questioned the idea of the good Anthropocene, and investigated perceptions of climate change among conservative Americans. Last year, she was the Baron Visiting Professor in the Environment and the Humanities at Princeton University, and she is currently serving as the President of the Society of environmental journalists. Thank you all very much for joining us and coming together today. Um, so we've come together uh, to discuss a particular subgenre of journalism, literary, narrative, long form. It goes by many names, but it tends to employ the tools of fiction, really, or tools that are more readily associated with fiction, which is voice, character, narrative. Uh, and because this type of journalism is more clearly driven by personality, uh, the personality of the writer, say, more than newspaper reporting, the writer must be aware of their personality and the degree to which they invested in the story that they're trying to tell. And all of you, to varying degrees, uh, have invested your presence in a piece of reporting uh, or in telling other people's stories. So I wonder, Alex, I'll begin with you. Um, how do you determine where you belong in a story and how does that manifest? Isn't that a huge part of the revision process? For me at least, um, taking all the material I have to work with, which in this kind of a narrative uh, is not only the researched and reported material, but of course is also exactly what you just raised, the question of where I myself will enter the story and sitting with all that material and um, sort of massaging the percentages is such a huge part of determining that. And for me, it comes down to where it will um, help the reader to come along with me into the story, help the reader to also understand the, the story I'm spinning from the situation, the story I'm spinning from the material. Alexis. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Alex because especially as someone who was trained as a newspaper reporter, I, I started my career working at a newspaper, working at a news agency. I was trained initially being reticent of including myself, including my voice in my uh, work. Um, and as I got into doing long form uh, and more narrative feature writing, I thought it was best to um, 
I, I guess just be just be really rigorous about where to use my voice to make sure that it serves a narrative, that it moves it along, um, that it's hopefully always illuminating uh, in terms of uh, revealing what I want to reveal about the story or about what I'm um, trying to say through my subject stories. Do you find that um, stories are better told in other forms? In other words, did you discover along the way in that transition from one type of reporting to another that while you may have been tempted uh, to do it as, as something that is more literary, let's say, uh, for lack of a better way of describing it, that it belonged in a certain type of genre or was, should be told in a certain type of way? Uh, in terms of including my voice? Yeah, or, you know, if it does something, you know, you could be tempted to tell a story uh, with more memoiristic elements because you have shared experience with the subject, um, but there's a choice to pull back um, regardless yeah, of the temptation to be involved. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, at least in my opinion, it's always reporting is most effective when the the specific details can be shown to be shared or universal. And so if you are able to tell something that you want to tell through another subject story, um, I think that's always more effective. Uh, and then, you know, your voice can come in or your experience can come in to, to emphasize that. But I think the specific details of, of your subject's lives or your subject's experiences are always most paramount and most useful. Mm -hmm. And Mira, how do you determine where you belong in a piece? Yeah, it's often just the um, the material itself. I mean, sometimes in the process of of um, doing the reporting, I realize that that like Alex said, that my presence is the way for a reader to enter the story. Um, but there's a lot of times when I've been out reporting and I have so much material and it just stands by itself, and I can just be this invisible um, conduit mm -hmm. for that. But but often it. It does, I find as a reader that I appreciate knowing who's taking me on this journey. I think the, um, the recognition now of how much we are all biased in, in some way, form or fashion all the time. And so that transparency about who you are and where you're coming from, I think is um, helpful for readers. Still coupled with the deeply rigorous, you know, newspaper trained journalism, uh, fact-based, mm -hmm. reported, researched, but also, um, that transparency. I mean, it was part of why I, I studied that form of journalism in school as opposed to just the straight newspaper science journalism. Right. And, and Jeff, you seem to have kind of covered all the bases in terms of where you position yourself in a piece. Um, I wonder how you, how you make that determination if you go in predetermined or if you discovered along the way. I, I think I, I sort of approach it as a distinction. There's the question of my voice and then there's the question of my body. Um, and, and the voice is always there, right? Um, or, or you're mm -hmm. always trying to get to your voice, to write, to write as yourself, not to write as an avatar of whatever publication mm -hmm. you're writing for. The question, the more difficult question is when does your, your body, your physical presence show up in a story? And I think about two examples, one in which I, uh, I was reporting in Russia on uh, Putin's anti-LGBTQ crusade, and um, and I sort of come into the story uh, only in two places. One where a Cossack, um, actual Cossacks, like Fedor and the Roof Cossacks, um, decides to sort of demonstrate his power by pointing a gun at me, you know, and he then pointed his gun at a reporter is a little odd. It, my fear, my body and my fear are, are relevant there. I think of another mm -hmm. instance I was reporting on Skid Row on a killing of a, a LAPD killing of an unarmed uh, uh, black man named Charlie Africa Kunang. Um, in the process of that reporting, um, I got uh, the police decided to throw me up against the wall and, you know, uh, and everything else. And so my body was there, but I did not include that in the story um, uh, because that kind of violence was so omnipresent and the relationship of the police to Skid Row, it added nothing. I didn't need myself to show that. It, it was there every day. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it's sort of this question of w w when you yourself sort of emerge from, from the surroundings to suddenly 
become, whether you like it or not, when someone's pointing a gun at you, whether you like it or not, you become the story. Right. Well, the, the Cossack reminds me of, um, you know, another aspect of this and, and the degree to which you all do get involved in your stories. Um, it, you know, it, it highlights another reason why I'm drawn as both a writer and an editor to this particular type of journalism, and that is that it's not prescriptive or didactic. Um, you go into it with a certain set of biases, sure. Um, but it is also a kind of safe space for quandary, right? It's a safe space for the messy complexities of other people, uh, especially antagonists. And all of you, to certain degrees, uh, have had to engage with people you might not necessarily disagree with, you might find disagreeable, you might find reprehensible. Um, and so I wonder how important is that engagement to the kind of journalistic truth-telling that you're doing in your work? Um, and is there a line? I mean, I'm sure there is. Where is that line uh, where you just have to draw it and say, this, this person isn't worth <laughs> making three-dimensional? Mira, I can start with you because I think in particular of um, that story where you go out, and I think it was a wonderful project to go out and find out what conservatives are, think about climate change, uh, a group we largely um, assume uh, are all climate de climate change deniers, right? And I think this was a way of just sort of bridging that gap. Yeah, this was, I mean, that, this was a, a nine part series for Inside Climate News that um, started in 2017. So right after the 2016 election. And uh, it was it was looking for places that were most impacted by climate change. Uh, ranchers who had sudden droughts and West Virginia towns that had been hit by uh, extreme floods, um, Georgia peach farmers who had lost their crop because the winter was too warm. So I was looking for impacts and then combined with uh, very, very red areas. I was just pouring over um, 2016 election maps. And so I went to, to just talk to them and it was really at, about finding out what they were experiencing because right, the media does kind of paint that picture that, that anyone who voted for Trump is a climate skeptic or denier. And I didn't find that mm -hmm. at all. I found it was way more complicated than that. And um, I mean, since then uh, there's a, Amanda Ripley wrote a piece about complicating the narrative and it's been a really, um, it was what I was doing out in the field, but she wrote about it so beautifully. And she has like 22 questions that journalists can ask themselves uh, and take out into the field. And really, I would say not just journalists, but everybody about how to listen, about how to really get into the motivations of what people are, what, what's driving people. Cause that is often what is missing in, um, in a lot of representations that don't have this nuance and don't engage with antagonisms. If you're just looking for a, a quick quote and if you're looking for the, mm -hmm. the extremes of the story and what, I mean, Yale Climate for Center, Center for Climate Communication has been studying per how people are reacting to climate change for, for more than a decade. Um, and all the stories are usually about the people who are like super dismissive or deeply alarmed. And, but the reality is that so many people are living in that space in between. And that's what I was finding when I was out yeah. talking to farmers, talking to ranchers, talking to fly fishermen, um, they're seeing changes, uh, but they're, they're uh, often, the questions are framed in a way that puts them in a very defensive stance. And then there's no, there's no room for nuance there. So trying to write in a way that gives them um, their humanity and gets to real, reveal some of their motivations for why they might buy into a certain narrative that's being put forth, um, it can be really instrumental. Yeah. And Alex, you had an interesting, you know, I want to pivot to you because your book, The Fact of the Body, really engages this issue uh, with, it, with a certain intensity. Uh, and I remember one of the things you had talked about in that book was that um, a kind of a metaphor I like to use with writers um, about the gray area. And you talked about that binary uh, as a, you know, comparing it to law. Um, and you can correct me because I'm going to mangle a little bit, but it was about people either good or they're, or they're bad, but they're not in between. Um, so I think you have an a fascinating perspective on how to engage these um, these antagonists. I was thinking about that with exactly that with what Mira just said about the idea of duality, about holding duality. So I was writing about a man named Ricky Langley, um, a convicted child molester and murderer uh, who is those things and is also a person with a very complicated history. 
Um, and Paul, when you posed the question initially, uh, the moment that was coming to mind for me from the fact of a body was uh, that I was writing off of these 30,000 pages of court records. And it meant that at moments when I was looking through the records, my emotions were so present in the room with me, right? Because of things in my own life, because of things in my own past, that there were moments where the emotion, then the complicated dance between emotion and revulsion, frankly, at times and fear and judgment, but then also um, empathy and the way that if you spend that much time with anyone, you start to have moments where you empathize. You're looking for that. Yeah. You're looking for that. And that's your job in some ways as a writer when you're rendering them as a character. Um, it caused me to misinterpret something, a, a pretty basic and horrifying fact. And, hmm. you know, I had a, a choice that I could make in the writing where I could either pretend I had never misinterpreted it. I had always understood it the way I eventually came to learn was the truth. Um, but I chose to put in my own mess up, my own slip. And I did mm -hmm. this to bring the reader with me into the complicated ways that emotions affect the way we perceive things. So I think that including subjectivity and including the, even the missteps that sometimes subjectivity helps you make can create something that is truer to the truth. I don't know how else to put that, but is more uh, fastidious about the truth. Right. Alexis, do you find that when you're doing, let's say, your more straightforward pieces of or straightforward reporting, that you're tempted to want to in, include this degree or this quality of messiness or this, this complication, but don't necessarily have the room for it? Um, or that, it, you know, how do you navigate that? Well, I mean, I, it's interesting thinking, um, like, about what Mira and Alex have both said about um, the gray area and about motivations, because I feel like I've actually been, especially over my time spent reporting in Africa, drawn to subjects and stories that explore that. Um, in my first mm -hmm. book, two of the stories were about people who I wrote about as being both perpetrators and victims. Um, you know, one story was about um, a couple who were first forced to be child soldiers in Uganda. Um, and while they were, had committed some atrocities, but of course had been victimized themselves. And I had also written about vigilantes in northeastern Nigeria who were fighting against a terrorist group, um, which was admirable, but who were also guilty um, of their own abuses against civilians. And these were people that I got quite close to over the reporting of these articles in this book. And you know, I was interested in the way that people are both good and bad, uh, and you know, at, at one point can be victimized, and another point can be doing the victimizing, and how that only makes people more human. Um, and so, I think, especially in that book, though, it was the first time because some of those stories had started as articles where I, my present wasn't really in the pieces. But then in the book, um, I did bring myself in to explain how I met these people, how I had spent time with them, my own sort of personal perspective on their lives, because I thought it was important to include that transparency. Um, yeah, to kind of, you know, to kind of break down the, 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 the wall a little bit and to show, mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, not only the, the nuance of their lives, but the nuance of how the, they tell the stories of their lives, um, because I thought that would be more interesting. Um, and so, yeah, when we're talking about how to write about antagonists, I think in a lot of my work, I try not to think of so-called antagonists as antagonists, because I think right. it's more important to think, again, about their motivations. You know, even when I was reporting um, in Eritrea, which is basically a police state um, with a government that's pretty hostile to the press, um, I tried to interview as many officials of the government as possible because they do have a very traumatic emotional history that kind of led to the fact that they are so, you know, to explain why they are as repressive as they are now. Uh, and so even though they didn't, they still don't like the story after it came out, um, I thought it was important <laughs> to, to, you know, explore where they were coming from. Well, that's always an interesting uh, conundrum, right? I mean, that's always an interesting struggle is to tell it fairly um, and to do it honestly 
um, with, with all of the sincerity that you can invest in that um, and for them to still be unhappy with the results. And you get them to trust you um, and you will stand by um, the integrity of what you've written, um, but nonetheless, they're, they're disappointed. Um, and it may be because they, they see a different version of themselves or they um, are very much aware of a particular narrative that they wanna maintain, right? Or a perception that they wanna maintain. Um, you know, Jeff, you're in, in unique uh, sort of unique circumstances here because you've been uh, you've had a, several pieces, I believe, um, recently where you attend Trump rallies and engage with um, Trump supporters as a way to. Well, I'm not going to sort of tell you what your your purposes were, um, but I wonder if you could speak to that because they've been very compelling pieces um, of sort of giving us an idea of what the the atmosphere is like. Um, and I think they're unique in their depth of engagement. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, you can tell me what my purpose, my purpose is I, I, I'm against Trump. I, I have <laughs> never, I never have any problems with that kind of like going in. I have a bias. I remember actually reporting years ago on um, uh, 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 genocidal anti-LGBTQ initiative in Uganda, this American-backed anti-homosexuality bill and American right-wingers saying Charlotte shows his bias. I'm like, you, you got me, I'm against genocide. <laughs> you sniffed me out. Um, uh, and, and the same with the, the, the Trump stories, I guess, except that, um, I mean, I even think of the, there's a piece that ran in Vanity Fair a little while ago called uh, The Second Coming about Trump rallies this last fall. And I, I was sort of interested in seeing, I had done the same thing in 2016, sort of traveling around, looking at them as as religious events, going not as press, but just sort of part of the crowd. And um, uh, and I went, I wanted to see what had changed. And, and so I wrote it for Vanity Fair. And I think these people are pretty frightening. Um, a lot of the people I met really are pretty frightening. But as I, now I oftentimes, I, you know, you, you write a piece for a magazine and then you get to Make it the way you really want for for a book. Um, I'm rewriting this piece, and I'm and I'm building it all around this one woman named uh, Diane, who was a devoted follower of QAnon, um, holds these terrifying beliefs. And I remember we were in in Florida, just talking for hours and hours. First on the floor of the arena, and then afterwards. And um, you know, over time, just what Alexis was saying, you know, the kind of the suffering, the fear, the paranoia, the illness that had led her to this place came through. And the question to me is always this question of monstrosity. I, I'm interested in that when we monster others and say that person's a monster, we're pretending that we're not vulnerable to those same things, um, that uh, somehow we're just sort of naturally virtuous. And Diane has decided to take the pain, the incredible pain that was given to her and to pass it along to others. I don't like that choice, mm -hmm. but my job is to understand how she came to that choice. Um, right. And I think that's our job as people, not just as writers. Did you find there was a transformation from this idea of, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about your most recent book with the, the that was f built out of these Instagram journalistic um, experiments where uh, someone is transformed over time or the process of writing. And I think of some of the, what I would say, the darker characters um, that, that surface in that book. Um, did any degree of empathy grow as they were incorporated uh, into the larger book project from the Instagram journalism series? Um, or just as you spent more time with them? Well, I Was think there a empathy is always growing. Inside? I think empathy is always growing, although I think of empathy a little bit, uh, I think that we're actually in a moment right now where I hear in sort of public conversation an awful lot of conflation of empathy with sympathy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And the way I try and talk about it with my students is you can have empathy for the devil. You know, you, you're trying to understand what it feels like. But there, there is a, a central figure in that book, a woman named Mary Mazur, who uh, is a mentally ill, um, sometimes houseless woman um, who through a set of circumstances, my life became intertwined with hers for a little while. And, and I wrote about her and, and it's funny when, when people read it or I go to events and so on, people really love Mary and I love Mary. Um, and I almost worry sometimes that people are losing sight that Mary is one of the most 
difficult and oftentimes she can be really cruel human beings. I mean, she, uh, her three children were taken away from her and she, as she herself notes, that was the right call. Um, uh, and, but my empathy grew for her. And I think in the context of the book, yeah, the more time you spend with this person, um, the more, the more you see this sort of common roots of suffering. Um, that doesn't, right. that shouldn't absolve anyone of the actions that they make out of those suffering, but we do need to see yeah. those common roots. Yeah, and it, you know, it strikes me as an incredibly complicated process, even for the reader, right? And and you know, we have to sort of <laughs> to state the obvious. We, are, you know, we're recording this uh, in October. The country seems it, and, I'm, and I, I'm jumping off of your point about empathy. Um, the country seems to be at a breaking point. I think we've left all hyperbole behind with the end of summer uh, at this point, and. All of these things that we're discussing are very complicated processes, not only for the writer, but for the reader. Um, and we find ourselves in a kind of panic state of consuming information just to get our bearings, right? Uh, and so one has to ask, is this kind of journalism that we practice a luxury? Um, you know, what makes it indispensable uh, right now? I think that's a fundamental question of why we've, why we've gathered in the first place, right? Mira, you took, you can, that's it. <laughs> the heavy first thing, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll dump it in your lap first. It's, it's absolutely necessary. I mean, we are, I think we're all um, vulnerable as journalists and as humans to be trying to keep up with, you know, what has become more than a 24 seven news cycle. Uh, we're trying to do that as citizens. We're trying to do that as humans, but, um, uh, but we need context. Humans are are aching for context of um, what all these what all these things mean and how they um, connect and how they don't connect. And I think that is that is absolutely where the role of long form narrative journalism it brings together storytelling, which is the fundamental way that we understand our worlds, is through the stories that we tell each other um, and any way that we can, I mean, getting the attention, getting people to sit down and read, that is definitely the challenge, but I think that we need these stories to help connect the dots. I mean, I'm thinking so much about, uh, you know, I've been thinking about environmental issues for 30 years, but uh, how the climate crisis has come to bring together all these seemingly disparate things that I've been interested in and covered uh, for so long, that's my role as a journalist to help connect those dots for other people who might not see that. Um, I mean, just as like the pandemic has laid bare uh, the disproportionate impacts on people of color, on people with fewer resources, um, how there's these multiple impacts from extreme weather coupled with inability to access healthcare combined with how the police are dealing with uh, and authorities are dealing with crises. All of these things come together. The pandemic has laid that bare, but um, climate change impacts are going to do that same thing for the long run. So how do we as storytellers make that real to people? Because we are not very, we're very good at stories, but we're not very good at long-term thinking, right? So how do we, through this more nuanced uh, form of storytelling, help make those worlds visible to people and, and make them real. Show what what the impacts are, show what it means to, to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Alexis, um, I want to pivot to you because, you know, I, I, I'm curious to know uh, with your work at The New Yorker and you, you're often in that cycle, in, involved in the cycle, in the news cycle. Um, you know, we can sit here and, and talk about the virtues uh, and how this type of journalism is indispensable, but I wonder if you have any thoughts on how the public um, can be made to feel that way because of just the degree of mistrust. And I realize that that mistrust is in large part due because due to the fact that this form, any genre of journalism falls under the umbrella of news, right? And cable news, uh, social media, the consumption of information there, the distortions, all of that sort of gives the rest of it a bad name. And so we could talk about why it's indispensable, but it, do you, are there any ways in which 
that can practically be communicated to the public such that, you know, and maybe they don't have time for a 14,000 word uh, piece of investigative right. journalism, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I feel like, um, you know, at, at The New Yorker, more I think more than ever, our website has become um, a really a crucial point of reader engagement. Um, you know, I, for one, you know, I, I, I do a lot of long form, but I feel like this year, especially with the pandemic uh, and, and the uprising, I've done, I've done a lot more web pieces um, because, you know, even coming top down from our editors, um, there was an urgency and there was a sense that the website is where a lot of readers are were engaging and are engaging right now. And how do we tell the same type of story has been in a shorter, more immediate format, still character driven, um, still narrative, but mm. uh, in a more immediate format. So if I'm writing about the defunding the police movement or I'm writing about the effect of the pandemic on different marginalized groups in New York, you know, how do we tell that same type of story, but, um, you know, in a shorter way, uh, but with still with, with depth and nuance. And I think the New York website has done a really good job of that this year um, on everything from the pandemic to the protests. Um, and, you know, reporting those stories is interesting. I mean, I, I think I still try to approach it in the same way I do um, more narrative long form, finding my characters kind of getting into, into, into their lives as much as I can within a shorter um, time span, and then trying to break down sort of bigger issues of the day like when I was writing, um, you know, for example, how uh, teenage essential workers of color um, are experiencing the pandemic in a totally different way than um, their other counterparts. They're both going to school and they're working at grocery stores, at restaurants, and taking care of sick relatives and really facing the burden of um, the pandemic in New York. Um, and so my job there was to find um, kids who I could shadow and spend time with and tell that story through, through their eyes. And then, you know, the same thing when I was writing about um, the defund the police movement, you know, what does that look like on the ground? Um, it means going to spend time with um, violence intervention groups in, Br in Brownsville um, and seeing what it looks like on the ground to be um, you know, dealing with crime in, in a high crime place and also dealing with um, abuses from the police. And so all of that is to say, yeah, I think that readers are engaging, you know, maybe not necessarily reading, you know, a long form piece all in one sitting, maybe they're going back to it. Um, but I think there is a hunger for stories behind the headlines of really big mm -hmm. concepts like police abolition or, um, you know, the coronavirus is, is, is killing black and brown people twice the rate. Like, what did these things mean for actual people? Right. Alex and Jeff, I, I want to go a little bit deeper into that. Um, and Alex, let's, let's start with you and Jeff, I'd like you to follow up. But, you know, what is it about this particular form, um, about long form, about narrative, about literary journal, all the things we've talked about today, what is it that about that form that hedges against falsehood? Do you think like why should readers trust it? We understand its importance, and we've talked about the, its value to the larger discourse. But what is it about the practice that almost is in, in kind of insurance against this the 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 fake news that people fear or are tired of, exhausted with? I mean, isn't the trap of the fake news the the constant way it erases its own authorship? Right? It, it's a mm. pretense at um, at objectivity that erases its own its own context. And what we're exactly mm. talking about is that this kind of long form journalism is in some ways the genre of context. It gives you a chance to say, well, how did we get here? Well, how right. did I arrive at this place? It's not it's not an assertion without that context. Um, and I think importantly, you know, to what Alexis was just talking about, it also gives us the space to ask what's next, to remember that the present moment is not the moment of forever. And that building whatever comes next requires understanding uh, what came before. Yeah, it's comfortable mm. with the question. Right. Yes, mm. and takes on that question, um, comfortable with it, and is is comfortable settling in, dwelling in the question, and understanding that the question is probably not new, that there have been permutations 
um, and relationships to power that are necessary over time. I'm thinking the project I'm working on now, the book I'm working on now, called, which is called Both and Neither, which is a history of the gender binary as well as an inquiry as to a sort of what happens next. Um, it, we're in crisis in the moment, right? So there are all these attacks on trans rights. There are all these um, the rise of turf thinking, certainly, for example, in the UK, although here as well. Um, and the present moment may be one of emergency. And you can get caught in this like reactive reactive response, this quick reactive response that prevents you from thinking, okay, how did we get here? And also, where are we going? And so this uh -huh. genre gives us a minute to ask the larger questions and out of that, build something new, build something new that is right. also old, build something new that holds space for us all. Going back to this idea that it, rather than being prescriptive, it's uh, very much about the process of asking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Which in itself is a more honest approach, I think. Yeah. Right. Jeff. Oh, it's hard. It, it's hard to add too much to to Alex's wonderful answer, except uh, th that I would point out. Um, uh, I mean, this work for me began with that uh, quote that is over. Uh, their shoulder there in the background and that picture of James Agee um, and the cruel radiance. You can just see the word cruel very largely, but of course that right. quote is the cruel radiance <laughs> of what is. Um, and to make sure I didn't mangle it, I just looked it up. Uh, for the immediate world, every, in the immediate world, everything is to be discerned with the whole of consciousness seeking to perceive it as it stands. So the aspect of a street in sunlight can roar in the heart of itself as a symphony, perhaps as no symphony can, and all of consciousness is shifted from the imagined the revisive to the effort to perceive simply the cruel radiance of what is. And I've always loved that, although only over time did I come to understand that it's simultaneously true and inspiring and horseshit um, because he, <laughs> it's revisive right there. He's talking, he's speaking in metaphor and um, which is another kind of, 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 of both and um, of this work of, of, uh, of, are in fact, um, and of work that foregrounds that always, that says that foregrounds this sort of perception and the failures of perception, like what Alex was saying earlier about including that uh, that misstep in their perception. Um, that's a much different endeavor than the newspaper that promises to publish a correction um, the next day. Right. That what we're actually trying to document is the very act of perception itself which is ongoing and doesn't have a resolution and is in the deepest sense journalism as in a journal, something that doesn't have an end. There's no newspaper that says, well, that's it, we've covered it. There's always the next day. There's always the next step in perception. Yeah. yeah. And to, yeah, I love that quote. Um, and I and I agree with you 100% on all counts, but I, you know, it's, it's just fascinating. The earnestness with which it, it is done uh, and which he's, you know, the earnestness of his own self-doubt, I think is, is such a fascinating thing to observe in that book. Um, we have some, we asked for some questions from the, the public uh, and we got some terrific questions and I wanna make sure we have time to get to those. Um, they, they're, they're extraordinary. Uh, and I, we really do appreciate uh, the degree to which people had have submitted questions and uh, have engaged with this topic um, with us. Um, I'll start with this one. This is an interesting one. Uh, all of you have written very difficult stories. Uh, and I, and to, the, to the degree that you're comfortable answering this, um, one question is, how do you take care of yourselves, of your, of your own well-being, your own psychological, emotional well-being, while diving so far into so many of these difficult stories that you tell. Um, Self-care for journalists, I think, is an important uh, issue, especially in these times. Um, any one of you can, can jump in. Or I'll just start with Alexis. It's <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen. Um, well, you know, I. Well, I mean, I have a great therapist. <laughs> Shout out to my therapist. Um, and also I have um, like a really good group of friends who are also journalists, who also do similar types of stories. And we stay in constant touch, talking to each other, um, you know, about the work we're doing and also how it's affecting us. And 
a policy I, I used to have when we could actually travel more is that when I would go report uh, abroad, whether it was abroad or somewhere for an assignment and like do all that work and then come back and write, I would always take some time off, off after that. Um, I would make sure, even if it was just a week, just to kind of decompress, especially if it was a particularly dark, dark or traumatic story. Hmm. Mira, you 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 seem to be covering uh, our inevitable <laughs> um, demise as a planet. How do you how do you keep your chin up? Yeah, um, <laughs> not very easily. A lot of the time, uh, I try to just remember that the the heartache and the sadness that comes from covering covering the environment at this moment in time, um, it's just the exact flip side of of loving the place that we live. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so I try to enjoy that as much as I can. I mean, um, as much as it's been, uh, I've, I've never stayed here at my, in my home in Cape Cod where I live supposedly year round, but I'm usually gone most or part at least chunks of the year. And I've just been here since March. And it's, that's translated into an entire gardening season of starting things from seed and uh, and seeing mm -hmm. the birds arrive and spend their summers here and then leave for their wintering grounds. And uh, so being part and, and present for that kind of thing keeps me, uh, keeps, keeps me going definitely in terms of just trying to remember that there's still a lot of beauty in the world and, and it's my job to seek it out as much as I'm covering all of the stuff that puts all of that in at peril. Right. Jeff and Alex, do you have any routines, any rituals to sort of maintaining your sanity? I, your that I, I was thinking about that question, Paul, because it's so central to um, to the last book that I wrote, This Brilliant Darkness, which is a lot about that. And I was thinking, boy, I should have a good answer for that. And then I realized, yeah. no, that's just the point. Um, uh, I mean, that book was... <laughs> in many ways, a sort of a slow motion suicide note. And then as I was writing what I believed at the time to be the last sentence at 44, I had a heart attack. So I don't have a, I didn't do whatever these, I'm listening to this good advice because uh, uh, I didn't do, I mean, you know, I had lots of terrific rituals, drinking, uh, speed, um, you know, I mean, the stupid things because you felt this urgency of doing the work and as much work as you could. Um, uh, and, um, I don't think that was wise. Um, mm. And I think now, as I sort of, as I look at this sort of long haul, you know, the, the, w you and I were talking about this before, Paul, and talking about this, you know, like, can we do long form journalism now? And I think of this as very much a long game. Um, no one's gonna tell right. the, the story in a news story or a long form story that's gonna make Trump go away. And if Trump disappears, there's a new level of authoritarianism in the United States is gonna survive. So now we think, okay, how can I keep telling stories and survive and endure whatever my circumstances, whatever my relationship to oppression is. Um, and that's the urgency. The urgency, If you, if, I think if people can recognize that the urgency is taking care of yourself to survive and keep telling stories. Um, but that's not and that's Yeah, right, no. I, I, Alex? I mean, my way is in the other room so she doesn't get on the call. Very, very, very large puppy who has no idea what's going on in the world, doesn't care, needs to go outside all the time. So the classic relationship between writers and dogs, I would say. Right. But what yeah. Jeff said, just remembering that, you know, self-care is part of the endurance act that is necessary right now. It's part of, it's part yeah. of the self-care is part of the work because it lets you do the work. Yeah. Well, speaking of the work, there's, there's another... Um, the next question, um, in a reported piece of nonfiction that uses literary and creative devices, how does a writer use both without sacrificing the integrity of the other? For example, if a passage could be written more beautifully and therefore more, be more artistic by omitting facts, which may change how the reader understands the story, should the writer do that? Is that ethical? We're always omitting facts. Every single, yeah. <laughs> every single goddamn story, you are building a frame, and there are right. things being left out, and there are things being put in. So, 
it's you know getting at the Don't fundamental let the heart. Don't the way of the truth, right? <laughs> but, but Mary, you wouldn't like, say that we should. Oh, oh well, no. I was just gonna say a quick thing that just that sometimes. I feel like sometimes the beauty of a passage can be enhanced by the specific details, you know, yeah. like instead of, um, I think some people think sometimes of some things more sort of vague or grandiose, it sounds better, but actually I think the beauty comes from that specific, you know, specific, yeah. specificity. Yeah. Right. It is using them with precision, not necessarily it's cause it's not a white paper. Um, it's a story. Right. And so some, yeah, there are degrees of, to which degrees of importance. But there's a different, I mean, and the beauty something... of difficulty too. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, go no, ahead, no. Alex, go ahead. Sure, if something no, Alex, is inconvenient, right? Which I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if something is inconvenient, which I think is what the questioner is pointing to, the idea that right. you might stumble across something that is an inconvenient detail for the, the story you were making, um, I try to pay more attention there. Right? Why do I think it's inconvenient? And what is revealed about the way that I am simplifying things in my head um, by that desire to admit something? And what might happen if instead we did what we've all been praising about this forum and lean into that complexity? Yeah. Well, and, and Jeff, and, and I, I, that, I mean, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I want you to go ahead and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just think that that difficulty, I mean, yeah, we're always admitting facts. And so to me, that question is a little bit, that's the work. You're admitting facts, but you're not admitting facts, ideally, that are 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 relevant. The same rule right. applies as right. that of an ellipsis, right? You can use an ellipsis if it's not changing the meaning uh, of the sentence. But the difficult ones, and and I, I think this is sort of a debate within creative nonfiction and literary journalism, because there are people who are fighting for the loveliness of symmetry. Um, and I am much more engaged by the glorious grotesque of difficult facts. <laughs> and I think, uh, it, I mean, I think of, uh, I mentioned before writing about that fellow on Skid Row, Charlie Africa Kuneng, who was killed. And, you know, there was a lot of stories at the time. He's unarmed, he's innocent, he didn't struggle, he was this virtuous guy. The difficult facts, but they weren't, I don't think they are difficult. Um, Charlie was high when he was killed. It has nothing, you shouldn't be killed for being high. Um, and Charlie, at the very end, when six cops were pinning him down and pressing a gun into his chest, he did, in fact, reach for the gun of one of the cops. He didn't get it, he reached for it because he was human, mm -hmm. because he was being murdered. And that difficult fact that takes us out of this sort of binary of perfect innocence or perfect guilt um, reveals the humanness. And to me, sort of brought me closer to the something that was should have been obvious all along, that when you're being murdered, you will struggle for survival and that is not a crime. Um, and, uh, and so I think, but you only get to that by saying, hmm, this story might, flow more seamlessly and perfect and you might be my more perfect victim otherwise but it's not true and that untruth is not beautiful right another question and if you all have anything to add on that um jump right in but if not i will go to the next question which is um well speaking of questions what questions do you wish were more central to the current news discourse um and i think that that could be combined with another question, which is, you know, what is your ideal vision um, for where journalism might be going and how journalism outlets might be evolving? Are there questions that are fundamental, that are critical, that aren't getting asked, um, whether it's with regard to uh, current events or just our practices as journalists? So much is breaking right. down right now, it feels like within society and within journalism. And my, you know, when the when the light side of me is overpowering the the darker um moments of what I think, you know, we could be heading towards, uh, I think about just new new more multi-genre, more um explosive. Mm -hmm collaborative ways of working and approaching storytelling. I mean, we we opened that door uh, with social media, with, you know, blogging at the beginning of just everybody being able to tell their story. Like, can that evolve into something that still gets back to um, more of the, the tenets of, of 
journalism and fact based, but people are are it is more democratic, um, and getting getting those stories out there in a way that are that that reach people that everybody can be telling their own stories, but in some way that is not just the free for all that we are having that uh, algorithms are directing us towards the most, um, the falsehoods and the, the most uh, extreme types of views. I don't know if that's possible, but that's, <laughs> that's a hope. Mm -hmm. Jeff, Alex, Alexis. I mean, I'd like to see just more, of the, uh, this sounds self-serving, the more of the stories that we all tell, um, but which is to say stories that um, uh, center the human beings and their complexities rather than the human as illustration of an abstract issue, which can then quickly cut to talking heads on, on CNN. So I think of Mira's incredible reporting on climate change, which is right at the, the forefront uh, to, in my mind, with, with writers like Emily Rabito and uh, Elizabeth Rush, in terms of saying climate change is not an issue that you can say yay or nay to it, only. It, it, it's, it is this thing that is happening in people's lives. And what does that look like? And I, I, I want journalism to do a lot more of that. And right now, I think that we're, we're responding to the urgency of the moment with a lot more abstraction, just when I think we can least afford it. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, that, that brings me around to uh, another question. Um, how has the landscape changed for journalism since you began? Um, and I wonder how you've adjusted your practice um, to, to respond to that. Um, you know, this is a radically different media landscape than it was uh, five, 10, certainly 20 years ago. Um, have you all, I wonder if you could, each of you speak to just how you've adjusted your practices and your, just your, even your approach, your attitude, your philosophy towards um, journalism as technology um, has changed it, uh, as the public's reaction to it, relationship with it has changed. Alexis. Oh, um, well, I, um, I guess when I started as a journalist uh, about 13 years ago, um, you know, social media and, and, and Twitter and all that stuff was like just about to, to, to kind of pop off. And I feel like now it's become, you know, obviously more crucial than ever in terms of um, not just sort of broadcasting your stories, but also like responding to reader feedback and and using it as a tool to um, to reach people who otherwise uh, it would have been harder to reach, which I think is a good thing. Um, and I think that, you know, it's interesting, like the project I'm working on now um, is about my home state of Alabama, and it has a lot to do with the others, what, what the others have talked about in terms of trying to in some cases, talk to people who have views who are opposing to mine, and but trying to get at their motivations and to kind of get at their complexity. Um, and I think that's become harder because of uh, the way the press has been painted, especially in places outside of uh, the Northeast, outside of the coastal areas. And so that's been an hmm. added difficulty. But I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, some of the things are the same by virtue of keep, uh, by virtue of returning to a place over and over again, getting to know people, spending time with them, you do begin to break down some of those barriers um, and hopefully get at, you know, the truths of people's lives. Jeff, I wonder if you have a some perspective. I think you and I are are sort of the. <laughs> See, you're the only saying I'm the oldest one here. I'm not. I'm not the oldest one, but I've been. You're not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. But but um, but I knew you, Mira, when you were just getting into things. Into um, it's true. Um, which is actually another perspective I would love to hear because you have lived a life in some ways as an activist and as a journalist and. Um, uh, um, 
but from my, you know, I, I think like Alexis, you mentioned social media. I think my first book I sold September 10th, 9-11. Uh, it was always very easy to remember that, uh, or September 10th, 2001. And my co-author, Peter Manso, and I had a website, uh, Killing the Buddha, and we sold it by telling publishers. We went around to all the big publishers, and they all believed us. And they said, do a lot of people read your website? And we just said, oh, yeah, yeah incredible numbers and this was back in a time when they're like you have a website we better give you a book contract it hadn't occurred to them they could actually check the traffic on that and see that for our small online literary magazine there was not such traffic um but i mean that's obviously the biggest the biggest change is economically has been amazing i mean the over over my lifetime um as a journalist that uh the only good news there is I think the devastation of media and media outlets has been so vast that we're almost back for media, at least in the sort of 1930s like moment, which is the age of the little magazines. And when it is so much more difficult um, to make a stable living as a writer, that you might as well write what you want because betting what's the way to you, you might as well write what you want and get another job, I guess, which is not very inspiring. Um, but just like in the 1930s, I do think there is this the kind of flowering of creativity um, because we're not all channeling toward the same sort of legacy publications uh, in the way that you could much more easily 20 some years ago. Alex, um, do you what do you see in terms of looking ahead towards the, you know, how does the horizon for this practice look to you? I love what's happening in creative nonfiction and in literary journalism where we're having more genre experimentation. And where mm -hmm. it seems to me that in response to um, in response to the all the sort of fake news, uh, whatnot, um, there is simultaneously a push to be very clear about sourcing and be very clear about mm -hmm. no, um, something is a fact. And that feels a little bit new in creative nonfiction. You know, there was, I, I do feel like the work that was being produced maybe 20 years ago um, was a little mm. bit looser yeah. with the facts. Yeah. And now there is a real concern to not give that away, right? But at the same time, then there still has to be a way to make room for the subjectivity, for the interpretation, for the layering, for the fragmentation. And I think we're seeing that in like I said, more formal and genre experimentation, which is really exciting to me because of what it offers the ability to capture about, um, to refer back to something Jeff said earlier about the process of perception or and about the experiencing of perception and to make space for the human. Wow, that's great. I think we'll end on that note. Uh, I wanna thank you all very much uh, for joining um, and for coming together today. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for the work that you do uh, and do what you can to, do it, you know, practice as much self care as possible in these times. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us for this, uh, for this panel. And um, you can again, uh, visit uh, in the closing credits, you will find information related to uh, that includes, excuse me, um, the URL mcdowell.org where you can learn more about the art of journalism initiative, as well as McDowell's mission, uh, its history, uh, and its programs. Thanks very much. Be well.